Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week and a Happy New Year to you all. Sorry there wasn't a video last Monday, but it was Christmas Day, so uh, frankly, I just wanted to do other things. So I'll make the first episode of 2024 a big mega double weeker, though it being the holiday season, things were generally pretty quiet, right? Wrong! <laughs> we got SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy Static Fire Insanity, a secretive space plane Falcon Heavy launch, five Chinese launches and four Falcon 9s, two Soyuz missions, Firefly Alpha and a successful return to flight for Blue Origin. Oh my! Let's waste no more time waffling and kick things off with Starship. Since the last episode of Space This Week, we've had not one, not two, but three static fire tests from Starbase, with a total of 40 Raptor fires in total. The first one came along on Wednesday the 20th of December. Now, I'm acutely aware that you've probably already heard about this one by now, so I'll keep it brief. In short, this was a static fire test of Ship 28, or as SpaceX described it on X, always Twitter in our hearts, the Flight 3 Starship. This involved all six Raptor engines, three sea level engines and the three vacuum engines. SpaceX even gave us this super cool slow motion view of the static fire from one of their drones. This was the final test required for Ship 28 ahead of Flight 3. Or so we thought. Last Friday on the 29th of December, we saw another Ship 28 ignition. This was only a single Raptor engine this time. The objective of this test was to demonstrate the ship's capability to perform a flight-like startup for an in-space burn. Now, as far as I'm aware, no such burn will be needed for Flight 3. The Starship will actually be launched just shy of orbit so that it re-enters naturally, but maybe SpaceX have changed the plans up from the first two flights. After all, once Starship enters service, it'll need to reach a stable orbit, and as such, we'll need to be able to perform at least one in-space burn in order to deorbit. and I imagine multiple such maneuvers very much will be needed for missions beyond low Earth orbit and for Artemis. The frost hadn't even fully melted from the fuselage of Ship 28 before the next massive static fire. Yep, this was by far the biggest roar to come from Boca Chica last week, a 33 Raptor engine static fire test of Booster 10, or as Elon labelled it, Flight 3 Super Heavy Booster, the same day as Ship 28 static fire. Surprisingly, there was no spin prime test of the 33 engines in the days prior to the main event. We just saw activation of the water deluge system, and then boom. I gotta let the audio play out for this one. So there you have it. I'm gonna assume that no further tests are required of the Flight 3 Super Heavy and Starship. All that's left is confirmation that the FAA has completed their investigation of the Flight 2 mishap and grand license for Flight 3. As you can see, the pad held up pretty well to the test, with no visible damage, but sadly, the same couldn't be said for one of the no trespassing signs, as spotted by Base Camp Zero. Although, if you ask me, I think this will probably make the sign even better at deterring would-be trespassers. In the interim between now and Flight 3, it looks like Booster 10's stint at the pad has come to a close. On the 30th of December, it was lifted off the pad, and Starship Gazer shared this photo of the engine section during the lift. In case you're wondering what those blue hoses are, by the way, those are the flex hoses for the Raptor Chill collection system. With all the excitement around static fires, it's easy to overlook another test undertaken by Ship 28, and that was the actuation of its payload bay door. It's great to see. Ship 24 and 25, the previous Starships to fly, and I guess Ship 20 as well, also originally expected to fly, all had their payload bay doors welded shut and covered up, so maybe SpaceX have finally cracked whatever problems they were facing with Ship 28. Maybe this time we'll finally see the ship carrying a payload. The plan for Ship 20, after all, was to carry a wheel of cheese to orbit, just like Falcon 1's test payload. The launch complex received the bold gateway to Mars lettering not too long ago, and it appears that further signage has been installed at the new gateway to the gateway to Mars. <laughs> SpaceX is now proudly displayed above the site entrance. Aside from the new signage at the site, work continued towards replacing the propellant storage farm, with the arrival of yet another large storage tank to the site last Thursday. Speaking of large tanks, what are the Super Heavies if not large fuel tanks, just with engines at the bottom? 
What I mean by this was, in retrospect, an awful segue to say that Booster 12 looks to be next in line for testing. It was moved off its stand in the Mega Bay and was sent off to the Macy's test facility to begin its test campaign for Flight 4. Flight 4 and 3 and 2 and 1 all, of course, launch from the one orbital launch pad at Starbase. But it looks like it won't be long before there'll be a second pad. We saw a tower segment arrive at Boca Chica from the Cape. I wonder how far along SpaceX will get in 2024. Will they get the whole tower vertical in just one year? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Starship was, of course, a cornucopia of activity last week, but Falcon was no slouch either. We saw five launches in total, four Falcon 9s, one Falcon Heavy. The first Falcon 9 of the fortnight was on the 19th of December. A fairly standard Falcon 9 mission this. 23 Starlink V2s were carried from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral by the rocket, and the booster made a successful drone ship landing in the Atlantic Ocean shortly after stage separation. Now the next Falcon 9 to fly was another Starlink mission, but this time it was a bit more interesting. Lifting off from Launch Complex 40 again, and again carrying 23 Starlink V2s, this was Falcon 9 Booster 1058's 19th overall flight. A record for SpaceX, and I guess the world. <laughs> the satellites were successfully deployed to Shell 6, and while the mission was a success, and the booster made a successful landing on the drone ship shortly after stage separation, I can't say that this story had a happy ending. So close to 20 total flights, Booster 1058 was unfortunately not secured well enough by the Octograbber on the ship's deck, and after encountering rough seas, it sadly toppled over. And as you can see in this shot of it coming back to port, the front fell off. A sad day indeed. I was so looking forward to seeing a Falcon 9 first stage clock 20 flights in total, but I guess we'll have to wait a little bit longer for that day to come. Luckily, SpaceX confirmed that newer Falcon boosters have upgraded landing legs with the ability to self-level and mitigate this type of issue. This booster definitely served SpaceX well though. This was the rocket that brought crewed spaceflight back to the US with the launch of Crew Demo 2, in addition to carrying more than 860 satellites, totaling more than 260 metric tons across its three and a half year service life. What's crazy to think about is that it took Falcon 9 19 flights to reach 260 metric tons, while Starship, when ready, can do this plus 40 tons more in only two, or just one launch if expended. It's truly going to change everything once it starts launching payloads. The launch and destruction of Falcon 9 1058 wasn't going to stop SpaceX from launching another Falcon 9 the very next day. On Christmas Eve at the Vandenberg Space Force Base, we saw the launch of the SAR AH-2 and 3, a pair of reconnaissance satellites for the German armed forces. The SAR AH satellites are replacements for the SAR Loop satellites. The SAR in the name stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar, while the suffix Loop is German for magnifying glass. The two payloads were deployed successfully, and the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed at the landing zone. The fourth and final Falcon 9 launch was another Starlink Shell 6 mission, lifting off on Friday the 29th, once again from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape, carrying 23 Starlink V2s on board. The first stage successfully landed on the drone ship shortly after separation. Why no launches from Pad 39A though? Why three from Launch Complex 40? Well, as you probably know, 39A was stuck configured for Falcon Heavy, which unfortunately saw a number of delays for its launch of the mysterious X-37B space plane. However, we finally saw it lift off on the same day as the last Starlink mission, Friday the 29th, carrying the space plane to its highest ever orbit. We don't really know a great deal else about this mission. The real purpose of the X-37 is classified, so yeah, I can't say much else. We do know that the two side boosters of Falcon Heavy successfully landed together at the landing site, and that among the classified things it's carrying, the space plane is also carrying NASA's SEED-2 experiment, which will investigate the effects of space-based radiation on plant seeds during long-duration spaceflight, something that will be no doubt essential for future missions to Mars. Firefly Aerospace's Alpha rocket made its fourth overall flight on the 22nd of December, carrying Lockheed Martin's tech-demonstrating Tantrum satellite to orbit. The launch went very well, with the first and second stages successfully delivering the payload to space. However, in order to achieve the exact orbit required by Lockheed Martin, 
and additional engine burn from the second stage would be required after a roughly 41 minute coast phase. Unfortunately, an anomaly prevented this and the engine fails to reignite. The payload was therefore deployed to a lower than planned orbit, though still sufficiently high enough that it can now begin operations. Though of course it won't be staying in space quite as long as hoped. The satellite is a demonstration platform which sports an electronically steerable antenna system as its main payload and both Lockheed and Firefly are hopeful that the spacecraft can still fulfil some, if not hopefully all, of its mission objectives before re-entry occurs. Fingers crossed. Blue Origin saw a return to flight of its new Shepard launch vehicle. After being grounded for over a year, following the launch failure and destruction of New Shepard Booster 3 back in September 2022. This launch saw Booster 4, the only known flight-worthy New Shepard booster Blue Origin has now, lift off from the Corn Ranch launch site carrying the HG Wells cargo capsule. Inside were 33 science payloads, with the rocket serving the same purpose as a conventional sounding rocket, in addition to 38,000 postcards from students around the world. The launch was a total success. The booster successfully landed at the landing site, and the capsule made a safe touchdown as well, after reaching an apogee of 107 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Hopefully, this re-qualifies Booster 4 for human flight, and we'll see more crewed missions from Blue Origin soon. Now, there were a number of launches from China over the past two weeks, so let's rapid-fire our way through those now. Christmas Day saw a Kwaizu 1A carry four meteorology satellites to low Earth orbit from the Chiquan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China. The satellites are operated by Xiong Microelectronics and will provide commercially available meteorological data services. The same day, a Long March 11H lifted off from the Bo Run Jizu platform in the South China Sea, carrying three Cheyenne 24 satellites to low Earth orbit. Now, the only thing disclosed about these satellites is that they'll be mainly used for space science and technology experiments. The following day, a Long March 3B launched from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center, carrying two B Do 3 satellites to medium Earth orbit. These will be the 57th and 58th satellites to join China's B Do satellite navigation system. The day after this, another Kwaizu 1A took to the skies from the Jiquan launch site, carrying another commercial meteorological data satellite for Xiong Microelectronics. The final launch from China left to discuss was a Long March 2C, which lifted off on the 30th of December from the Jiquan launch site again, carrying three experimental Hulian Wang 4 communication satellites to low Earth orbit. This launch marked the fourth orbital deployment in China's space-based internet technology demonstration program, though aside from that, official sources haven't made many further comments about the nature of these satellites. Perhaps even more secretive than China, though, was Roscosmos, Russia's space agency. On the 21st of December, a Soyuz 2.1A lifted off from the Plesetska launch site, carrying a classified satellite for the Russian military. And that's all we know about that one. Another pretty secretive Russian launch was a Soyuz 2.1V, distinguishable from the regular Soyuz by its lack of side boosters. Sorry, I couldn't find an HD version of the launch footage, but regardless, the rocket again launched from the Plesetska Cosmodrome on the 27th of December, carrying another classified satellite for the Russian Air and Space Forces. Although I didn't get a chance to make a space this week over Christmas, I did manage to maintain my Saturday upload schedule for KSP. Yesterday, I posted my 2023 review of my favourite KSP-1 and KSP-2 missions that I did this year, and the week prior, I visited the Petrified Kraken on Bob, one of the new several dozen discoverable sites that were added with the game's For Science update. I got big plans for this game in January, let me tell you, chief among which will be to do a full playthrough of the science mode thus far, as well as, lord help me, try to do an ELU surface landing and return on the first launch of a new save. No additional tech unlocked, which, frankly, I'm only partly sure is possible. So if you want to see me suffer, then make sure you hit subscribe and of course rung the bell down below and hey, if you enjoyed today's video, then a like on the video also goes a really long way. And if you want to support what I do here on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, just like the amazing people on the left did, then hey, I always appreciate that so much as well. But that's it from me. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have an excellent 2024 and I'll catch you in the next one.